In the past decades, Asia has benefited enormously from open trade, investment, and multilateral cooperation, and became a leading global trade hub. But recent economic and strategic developments have fueled uncertainty in the region. How does power competition influence regional stability? Can China and the U.S. manage to find common ground despite of their differences? And will Japan and South Korea find a diplomatic solution for the deepening trade disputes? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the first half by Mr. Yuan Peng, President of Chinese Institute of Contemporary International Relations. And when we come back, I shall be talking to Mr. Biz Gill, Chief Executive Officer of the Center for American Studies at the University of Sydney. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue, Mr. Yuan Peng. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the latest uh, trade talks between the United States and China? Uh, China says uh, substantial progress has been made in some areas. Now, do you see some kind of a silver lining that may indicate clearly that eventually, despite the process of marathon talks, the two sides are ready to reach an agreement about the keeping trade balance? Yeah, I'm uh, cautiously opt optimistic of this coming uh, agreement because from uh, March 22nd and 2018 on, the trade will last more than one, uh, one, one year. That's too long. It's a bad for both countries and the world economy. And after 13 rounds of dialogue, I think this time a little bit different from before. Uh, number one, and Donald Trump and his team repeatedly said that they will have some agreement Originally, they want to have a package of agreement, but this time they agree as a phase one, phase two, phase three. Now, uh, focusing on the phase one uh, agreement, and also there were very good uh, you know, opportunity that is a coming summit of APEC in Chile. APEC, Donald Trump has already decided to go. He was absent last year. But this time, the reason for him to go, my guess is that maybe not so interested in the APEC per se, but to sign some agreement with China is more important for him. For Chinese side, you know, we are very sincerely pushing for uh, rounds of dialogues. So we also want to uh, reach some agreement. So this time I think uh, we are coming to, coming to end in the phase one. However, we have to say that uh, Donald Trump and his team is so unpredictable that uh, last minute, you know, I hope no surprise. The election is coming. Yes. Probably the phase one agreement uh, might simply be called uh, a compromise uh, that President Trump seeks uh, to please uh, some of the supporters and part of the electorate back at home. So it's part of the political theater between Republicans and Democrats. We may not take this uh, olive branch very seriously in this context. Uh, yes, on one hand, I think it's a good news that uh, uh, any deal is better than no deal because of uh, this uh, is a signal more than substantial for the two economies and for entrepreneurs for and even for average people all hope some agreement. However, this is a phase one just touch some superficial uh, issues. For American side, even for American side, they are not so satisfied on this. They are criticized by its domestic media. They said Trump just for, you know, the election. Because Trump focused more on Chinese buy more agricultural uh, goods from maybe uh, 24 billion US dollars to 50 billion US dollars. He uh, boasted that is a big winner for for the agriculture for the uh, farmers. And uh, you know, farmers is a very his uh, deep supporters in the last election. And this election, it matters more than uh, last. And uh, for Chinese side, you know, the tariffs still there. You know, our final goal is to you know relieve all those tariffs. So both sides are not 100% satisfied, but uh, both sides agree that this is only phase one. So after phase one, maybe we're moving to phase two, phase three. It's, it will be a long story, I think. 
there are mixed feelings on the Chinese side about the role, importance, and even character of President Trump, because uh, he is unlike Democrats uh, uh, who uh, uh, keep talking smart about human rights and democracy, uh, values, so on and so forth, in shaping the bilateral relationship. This guy, I mean, President Trump, only focuses on business deals. He's the author of Arts of Deal, and therefore is a blessing. On the other hand, he is a curse, uh, because uh, after all, in many of the policy papers, uh, China is described as um, a uh, strategic rival or adversary uh, for the American national security. Uh, what do you think of uh, the uh, image of President Trump? Is it a curse or more of a blessing uh, for our national stakes? <laughs> Trump is very uh, mixed <laughs> and a uh, very uh, unprecedented uh, figure in, in the American political history or maybe in the world. I think on the one hand, maybe he's a businessman, uh, a developer in some sense. So, mm, the, mm, focus too much on the business rather than human rights ideology. But on the other hand, maybe even if he he uh, spoke less on human rights issue, but he did something really seriously. For example, Taiwan Travel Act and uh, and the Xinjiang related acts. He also supported uh, those. Most importantly, the the guys surrounded him a very deeply ideological driven uh, person. So we cannot view Trump just by his own, but also should view him through the whole teams. The whole team is still, I think, is very deep ideological driven. Uh, what do you think of uh, Democrats who recently passed uh, uh, in the House uh, a bill on human rights and democracy in Hong Kong? Uh, we all know the consequences arising from the chaos and turbulence uh, in this territory. Um, do you think Hong Kong is being used by both the United States and Taiwan as a bargaining chip um, geopolitically, and therefore we've got to be very careful? Uh, Xinjiang, Taiwan, Hong Kong are some of the cards that the U.S. Uh, uh, prefers to play, and what do you think we should do to avoid uh, you know, uh, making mistakes so that we will not be further involved in the game of rivalry. Yeah, of course, American uh, politicians want to use the Hong Kong card to play, other than just trade card or. Uh, but they are Democrats, not the Republicans. The Democrats uh, pay attention to values, human rights, and democracy. Yes, uh, we cannot just say Democratic uh, focus on human rights value and the Republican focus on strategy and business. Sometimes this is uh, too simple to divide. But Both I want parties. to go back to history. For example, uh, the Carter administration was known for human rights diplomacy. Uh, he came from Democrats. Uh, and therefore, it seems that Democrats have long boasted of uh, their tradition of uh, being very careful about democracy in developing countries, right? But you know uh, Donald Reagan and uh, Reagan. Uh, President Bush also very you know deep ideological value driven. For example, uh, access of evil, this labeled by by uh, George W. Bush is very uh, ideological. So it's very hard to say which party is more value. But generally speaking, uh, Democratic Party uh, pro value uh, human rights a little bit more than Republican. But generally speaking, they are both uh, very a human rights or ideological driven policy. Um, between the United States and China stands Russia. <laughs> uh, we are talking about the issue of a world order. Mm. And uh, re mil to militize is always uh, viewed as a barometer to gauge uh, whether the relationship is healthy or reliable. Now, I, I noticed that there is a quiet shift in the mail to mail ties between Russia and China. Look at uh, East 2018 military drills. For the very first time, uh, by the way, that's the largest of its kind in the post Cold War era by the Russians, and China was invited uh, on an unprecedented scale. Uh, the Chinese army was involved. Um, do you think this has made it open and uh, delivered a clear message to the United States? So look, China could uh, look to, uh, uh, could get closer to Moscow 
uh, we could rebalance the pivot to Asia, back to Asia, or Indo-Pacific strategy that was first initiated by the Obama administration. What do you make of the geopolitical reconfiguration that, um, uh, that, that the Americans might have been brought to the edge of the seat and might be very careful? Worry. Yeah, yeah, very good question. I think uh, during the Cold War, the famous triangular relations among U.S., Soviet Union, and China constitutes the, the core of the international order and uh, international politics. The same case now in among the three major powers, Russia, China, and uh, the United States. Some scholars like uh, John Mishamer uh, once... Whom I interviewed a few days ago. Uh, yeah, wants to yeah. use Russia though to, to hedging against China and uh, this is a Cold War you know, paradigm of, of thinking. And today as Chinese leaders uh, repeatedly said that uh, China-Russian relations, even the joint military exercises, will not target to the third parties. We just for all, for all bilateral, deepening our bilateral relations. And today we, we in Shangshan Forum, we are very happy to see that the Defense Minister of Russia, the first time, come to Shangshan Forum, which shows the new level, new level of uh, China-Russian mule-to-mule uh, cooperation. We are not allies. We won't pursue ally relations. But um, this not necessarily means we won't pursue a deepening mule-to-mule -mule relations. We're not talking to the third parties. But uh, the relations per se constitutes some balance to some, you know, dangerous actions made by the third parties. We've been talking about the geopolitical rivalry, competition, so on and so forth. Uh, it's not a game of uh, a zero sum uh, from the Chinese perspective. Trump may look the other way around. Let's look at the, in what areas the United States and China could join hand to promote their common stakes. Uh, very quickly, can you? Uh, outline uh, those areas where we see more of the silver lining instead of the nasty uh, uh, return of the Cold War to, to the Cold War. Yeah, U.S.-China relations should not be shadowed just by the current trade war uh, temporarily because the U.S. and China are two major powers. We have mm, lots of common interests. For example, how to jointly reform and build up the new World order. Mm -hmm. In this uh, century, no single country can build up the new order by its own or by its uh, allies. This is a multipolar world. Uh, and for, uh, for example, the, the climate change, mm -hmm. non proliferation, those world uh, global issues need a global cooperation. Uh, climate change, because of Trump's policy, become a problematic. But uh, there are some widespread uh, consensus. So if uh, some new president came into power, maybe still constitute some base. And, uh, and also economic and trade relations still, still the pillar of the relations. Uh, sooner or later, we will overcome the current difficulty and find some solution. We just upgrade the U.S. trade relations in, the new, in, in a new, new era. And uh, even in Asia Pacific, and uh, we, we have some in common because both sides want to maintain peace and stability in the region. We welcome uh, the United States play some constructive role as an Asian Pacific power. We never deny its status. We just want them to play constructive role. And uh, so, in the future, how to balance American-centered bilateral military allies? and the Chinese initiated the multilateral security uh, regime is a major task in, uh, in jointly shape the 21st century uh, Asia Pacific. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It seems uh, all high-end dialogues high-level communications have been suspended other than the latest round of trade talks uh, in our bilateral trade. Uh, is that a very strong signal of danger? It could be very dangerous. I, mean, I think we're in a way uh, you know, locked into a structural uh, set of differences and, and competition 
that I, I suspect is going to be with us for the next 10 or 15 years at least. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. Thank you. There have been policy debates in the United States as to what the uh, bilateral relationship between Washington and the Beijing would be like 40 years after the normalization during the Carter administration. Now, uh, we've heard different voices, uh, and therefore, it seems you haven't been able to achieve a consensus as to how to deal with this uh, rising power. Some would uh, describe this as an inevitable clash uh, in Thucydides' tribe. Others would say it's a cold peace, if not cold war. Um, I'd like to have your thoughts briefly about the impact of China's rise and what it means for the most consequential bilateral relationship in the 21st century, particularly after Trump took office. Right. Well, you know, I think you're right. Um, the United States uh, has a range of voices and views on the relationship with China, um, but I think there is a kind of dominant narrative uh, emerging particularly inside the Beltway in, in Washington, uh, which uh, is taking a harder look at the relationship with China, uh, questioning a lot of the past assumptions and expectations about that relationship. And uh, what we see as a result, I think, is a kind of hardening of the American position vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, what, what I've termed this uh, in the context of relations with Australia is bounded engagement. In other words, uh, you know, notions of decoupling or you know, ending the relationship in some way or another, economically, politically, the policy of diplomatically. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not possible. I, I don't think decoupling is a very wise or even useful mm -hmm. concept. Uh, but we will see a narrowing of the, uh, of the engagement. Uh, we'll see a kind of narrowing of the parameters of the possible between our two countries. Uh, and you know, it's not it's not just a question of the mood in the United States. I mean, I think China also uh, has increasingly adopted uh, a, a, a political policy towards the United States, which also is going to limit the parameters of the possible. So, unfortunately, going forward, um, our two countries are going into a phase of competition uh, where uh, it's going to be a lot harder for us to manage the relationship. It's not cowboys in Texas that tend to look at things in black and white terms, but the more and more Chinese would also look at a bilateral relationship uh, through the black or white uh, prism. And therefore, that's very dangerous if you continue the policy of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, as I asked this question 20 years ago in my first show of dialogue, if you take China as a friend, it will be a friend. If you take China as a, an, an enemy, it will probably become the enemy of the United States. Now, what do you think of the current use of uh, different labels, adversary, competitor, rival, um, one short step, uh, one small step short of using enemy, public mm. enemy. Mm. Um, w w what are the shades of differences for these labels? Or you don't take these labels very seriously. Uh, you would rather examine the practical competition and uh, cooperation in a selective manner, uh, step by step, very cautiously? I would take these, these terms very seriously. I mean, I think there is a change in the way that uh, China is being viewed in the United States at the highest political levels. And we see it across the spectrum, Democratic, Republican, Independent. So I would take this this shift in the American mood quite seriously if I were in Beijing. Um, yes, it stops short, I guess, for most of, of saying enemy, but I think the, the idea of, uh, of a strategic competition uh, is a valid and um, even useful way of trying to think about what our relationship is going to be like going forward. Um, competition can be a good thing, right? It forces uh, the two countries, I think, to rethink old assumptions to try and recreate a different sort of relationship between the two. And of course, sometimes competition can actually drive innovation and, and progress. But you, we, you know, we need to figure out how to manage uh, our yes. adversity of the situation, uh, crisis in the South China Sea, and even Taiwan. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but it seems uh, all high-end dialogues, mm -hmm. high-level communications have been suspended other than the latest round of trade talks uh, about, you know, uh, whatever disputes concerning the deficit or, uh, you know, in, a, in our bilateral trade. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a very strong signal of dangers? Uh, I think it it's, 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 it's could be very dangerous. I mean, obviously, these two countries are the two most important in the world. That bilateral relationship is consequential not only to themselves, but to everyone uh, around us. Uh, so, obviously, if we are moving into a period of deterioration and animosity, that's not good. Uh, it's going to be a more, more dangerous situation. Um, and we'll just have to see, I think. Uh, you know, I think even a new administration in uh, China uh, or in the United States uh, is unlikely to change that pattern. I mean, I think we're in a way, uh, you know, locked into a structural uh, set of differences and, and competition that I, I suspect is going to be with us for the next 10 or 15 years at least. Um, and, you know, when we get to the other end of it, uh, we'll see, you know, whether we can remain friends. I hope so. Most of the Chinese uh, experts of American studies, so the real danger is perhaps we have different options on the. T I mean, we, we have different perspectives in examining mm -hmm. uh, the diversity of the bilateral relationship. But one thing that upsets China most is that in the White House, in the Oval Office, you don't have real China hands. And you have this uh, uh, president who is known for being obstinate, stubborn, unpredictable, refuses, who refuses to listen to uh, different voices. I instead, of she, he relies on the use of a tweet. I mean, uh, yes. the presidential. Well, you know, th I think it's a little unfair to say that he's th that he doesn't have. Uh, it's probably true that his closest circle of advisors, namely his own children, uh, and some others, uh, are outside of the normal policy process, mm -hmm. and none of them, I don't think, by their own admission, would say. Peter that Navarro that has never been to that China, that, 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 that and yet he wrote the book uh, dwelling upon yes. the threat of China. Yes. Recently, right. we we saw the barrage of a. A criticism against uh, his right. uh, pseudonym, the false name, but at a, but at, 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 singling at, out at, uh, at, at a lower level. And I totally agree with you that uh, you know, at that lower level, they don't seem to be breaking through and, and, and able to help shape the president's thinking on these things. But at the, you know, at the assistant secretary level, you've got excellent China expertise. Uh, at the deputy national security advisor is a longtime China watcher. I lived and worked here in China. Um, Randy Shriver, you know, Assistant Secretary at the Pentagon. Uh, David Stilwell, Assistant Secretary at the State Department. But you're quite right. This particular president's uh, approach to governance, right, uh, is very singular and, um, and obviously uh, wrapped up in his own uh, sort of egotistical understanding of, of, of wisdom. So that's a problem. It's a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it'll be very interesting to see whether or not he can get reelected. Uh, right now the betting is he would be. What other questions uh, China has or China watches, uh, be they in the United States, Europe, Asia, or China, would always ask is uh, unless the United States could align itself with the European partners and allies or Japan in the crusade against China, you would not be able to form easily a coalition of willing against right. China to contain China seriously. Mm -hmm. And the issue is indeed that uh, President Trump fails to uh, persuade European politicians uh, to take side on the issue of Huawei or geopolitically whatever. So NATO leaders, uh, I mean European leaders, uh, uh, are trying to figure out whether uh, China is a real threat to their right. uh, states. Even if we are a, a, a systematic uh, rebel or competitor, mm -hmm. uh, they would rather prefer to have a, a dialogue instead of uh, right. imposing sanctions like what Washington has done. So yeah. what do you think of this challenge for policymakers? I call, the the dual, I call it the dual dilemma. The dual um, dilemma. American allies have a dual dilemma. Uh, they have a rising China which presents both opportunities but also challenges uh, to their interests um, on the one hand, but then they have this sort of uncertain America on the other and all the more so uh, yes, your country is seriously divided. All the more so with this particular president, who who does not see value in alliance relationships and the like. Um, that could be the single most important change if he were to lose the election next year. I think whether it's a Republican or a, uh, a Democrat who 
ends up in the White House after him, I suspect they will try, they will try to rebuild and uh, reestablish these relationships of trust that we've enjoyed with, with allies and friends around the world, which is just a singular, enormous advantage that the United States has uh, in its competition with China, uh, but which this president has um, frittered away, honestly. So I, I think that might change. That could change. But as you say, you're right. It's, it's a big dilemma for, for allies. You know, I live in Australia. Um, it's a huge debate in Australia how to balance what is, on the one hand, a very constructive and beneficial relationship with China, particularly economically, on the one hand, against the rising concerns in Australia about China's power, about uh, you know, projection of its influence abroad, and the like. It's a very, it's a dilemma. It's a serious dilemma, and, and practically every country in the world is, is wrestling with it. The rise of a nationalist sentiment in both the United States and particularly in East Asia would be a serious challenge mm -hmm. to the stability of this region. Yes. Um, the younger generation in China enjoy the dividends of peaceful rise and development. Uh, they are patriotic. They never experienced uh, the misery and the hardships uh, that their parents and parents' uh, parents uh, went through during the Cold War, during the Cultural Revolution. The, so they love the government, they love the party, they love their country unconditionally. Now, when President Trump and the whole country he represents in the crusade against China uh, goes crazy, uh, goes to extremes, then you're around the risk of driving the young Chinese who have been educated in the West to the other side across the aisle. And that will be very dangerous to the future. So the danger of a rising nationalism might be a common concern yes. for both sides, right? Yes. It's, so it's, that, that it's, it's a phenomenon we see all across the world, yeah. right? And, and I, I don't quite understand what the source of it is, but it, is, it does seem to be of, a, of the current generation uh, that is um, maybe um, finding, uh, finding favor, finding identity uh, in their own national uh, uh, patriotism. And that's going to, yeah, drive, it could drive, it could drive, uh, even, even, you know, certainly in a democracy, that's going to drive elections, that's going to drive what politicians say and do. Mm -hmm. uh, but even in China, uh, of course, the leadership here has to be responsive, uh, maybe not through elections, but, but at least responsive to what the society demands of it. Uh, so we're, we're moving into a, a more dangerous situation, I totally agree. Um, I think that what President Trump represents, unfortunately, is, 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 is sort of eroding uh, the, the, the national psyche uh, in the United States, and, it, and I think it is quite dangerous, and I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried as well. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah.